Shalom. This week we are reading Parshat Ve'et Hanan, the second Torah portion in the book of Devarim. And this Torah portion contains such beautiful things, exhortation to do all of the mitzvot. It contains praise of the land of Israel. It contains the Shema, Hear, O Israel, and a review of the Ten Commandments. But this Torah portion begins with Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, literally begging Hashem for one thing. Va'et Hanan, the first word of this Torah portion, means literally, I begged Hashem, I implored God at that time, saying. And our sages point out that there are a number of different expressions of prayer, different words in the Torah to convey the concept of prayer, of a prayerful experience. This word, va'et Hanan, and I implored Hashem, or literally, I begged God, has to do, the root of it is connected to the concept of prayer that is just ultimately throwing oneself on God just f for His mercy, for His kindness, not in the merit of anything that I've done, not because I have any, any, sort, of, any sort of credit, but just throwing myself on God's mercy. That's this, this idea of chanun, chinun. So Moshe is begging Hashem for what? For one thing, for the thing that he wanted the most, and that is, he says, And he's wanting to know if maybe there's still some sliver of a chance that God would rescind the decree that he made earlier and would indeed allow him to enter into the land of Israel after a lifetime of selflessness, of dedication to God, to His Torah, and to His beloved people of Israel, Moshe is about to take leave of his family, the people of Israel. As we've mentioned, the whole book of Devarim is a retrospect. It is Moshe's parting words, his review, as he is about to leave his people. And he's expressing himself now that there's only one thing that he's begging Hashem for, and there is a concept that our sages discuss that Moshe Rabbeinu actually prayed 515 specific separate prayers begging Hashem for one thing, to come into the land of Israel. Let me, let me now cross and see the good land that is on the other side of the Jordan, this good mountain and the Lebanon. This is all he wanted to do, to come into the land of Israel. And just as we discussed the fact that Parshat Dvarim, which we read last week, always falls out on the first Shabbat in the month of Av, Shabbat Chazon, which is the Sabbath that precedes the ninth of Av, and that the portion of Dvarim which begins with a concept of rebuke, that that is an allusion to the concept of the rebuke of the month of Av, so too this Torah portion, Va'et Hanan, the second Torah portion in the book of Deut Deuteronomy, always falls out on Shabbat Nachamu, the Sabbath of consolation, which is called so because of the Torah reading, the, the Haftorah, the prophetic reading that we read on this Sabbath from Isaiah 40, be consoled, be consoled, my people. And that is, of course, a prophecy regarding the end of exile. And actually, this Torah portion falling out as it does on the Shabbat after Tisha B'Av is also intrinsically connected with the desire that we all have to see the building of the Holy Temple because our sages actually point out something very amazing about the words that Moshe employed here in the beginning of this Torah portion. He said, let me please cross over and see this good land which is on the other side of the Jordan, this good mountain and the Lebanon. What is Moshe talking about here? Does he want to go to Israel? Does he want to go to Lebanon? What mountain? Our sages tell us that this is an allusion to Jerusalem. This goodly mountain is actually Jerusalem. 
And the Lebanon is an allusion to the Holy Temple. And Moshe wanted to see Jerusalem built up and the Holy Temple. Lebanon is a code word in the Torah in many instances for the Holy Temple. In the Song of Songs we find that many times because the root of the word Lebanon is Lavan, white. There's a concept that the Holy Temple whitens the sins of man, brings about this spiritual alignment, and therefore it's called Leb Lebanon. So, in other words, this verse is telling us that Moshe's true desire was to enter into the land of Israel in order to see the Holy Temple established. There's something also very kind of strange about what Moshe says here in the very beginning of this parsha, because he explains that at that time when God gave that, when God made that decree against his entering into the land, that he begged Hashem, and he continues in verse 26, but Hashem became angry with me because of you, and he did not listen to me. Hashem said to me, it is too much for you. Do not continue to speak to me further about this matter. What is the meaning of these words that Moshe seems to be adding here? He says, Hashem became angry at me because of you, or on your account. Actually, when we go back to Parshat Chukat, when the decree was originally made against Moshe in Numbers chapter 20, we find very clearly that God said, in verse 12, chapter 20, Hashem said to Moshe and to Aaron, because you did not believe in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you, should, you will not bring this congregation to the land that I have given them, because you did not believe in me. So that is the source in the Torah of the actual decree. So why here does Moshe say, he became angry with me on your account because of you? Actually, this really... Um, relates also to something that we read in last week's Torah portion in Parshat Devarim. There too, we found in chapter <coughs> in chapter one, in verse thirty-seven. There also, Moshe said, "With me as well, Hashem became angry because of you, saying, you too shall not come there.'" So this is actually difficult to understand. Why Moshe is seemingly blaming the children of Israel for his inability to enter into the land. And actually this is connected to the content of his request that he wanted to enter into the land to see the Holy Temple. And this is actually an allusion to a very profound concepts that our sages teach us. And it goes like this. It's, it's a bit, a bit uh, difficult to comprehend. It's a huge concept. It's a huge concept. Our sages teach us that actually it was for the, for the good of the children of Israel that Moshe never entered into the land. Almost as if it was something that was preordained, that was that was agreed upon between Hashem and Moshe, because they explain, were Moshe to have entered into the land with the children of Israel, he would have seen to it that the Holy Temple was built. It would have been built under his direction. And that Holy Temple would have been of such a different caliber that it never would be able to be destroyed because it would be the temple that Moses erected and as a reflection apparently of his level of closeness to Hashem and his righteousness, that temple would have been somehow enveloped with the, the merits, I suppose, of Moshe and as it were, it would have been somehow laminated against destruction and never would have been able to be destroyed. And our sages continue when they explain this lofty concept, that wouldn't have been so good because Hashem saw that in the future, eventually the children of Israel were going to err, and they were going to fall away from the path of following Him, 
and a decree was going to be made against them. But because of the fact that the temple was not the temple of Moshe, the wrath that had to have been fulfilled through the decree was poured out on the temple itself, on the structure of the temple. And even though many Jews went into exile, many Jews were killed, the bulk of the decree fell upon the temple itself and not on the people of Israel. But had Moshe built the holy temple, it never would have been able to be destroyed. And therefore, when the time came, uh, when the time of God's wrath would have come, the decree would have been made against the people themselves. And therefore, ultimately, what we see is that this was all for the good. Because the idea of Moshe being prevented from coming into the land served the purpose of protecting his beloved people. It's almost as if he continued to be with them. He continued to, to benefit them, to show of his great concern and love and protection for them even after he, he passed away and left them by not going and staying with them because that wouldn't have been so good for them if that temple would have been built, it would have been indestructible somehow. Again, these are concepts perhaps we don't fully understand, and this is not the time to go into that exactly, but somehow it would have been indestructible, and therefore a decree would have fell upon the body of Israel itself and not against the, the building. And this is what they say regarding this elusive concept of the would-be temple of Moshe. But I look at this whole thing, and I'm trying to derive from it a life lesson. Because every time our sages emphasize to us an idea, our job is to translate the idea into something practical and actual, something that applies to us. Because otherwise, they would not be telling us such a profound lesson. There's something here, it seems some, somehow a bit elusive. It seems to be just on the edge of our consciousness. What is really going on here in this conundrum, in this somehow, uh, in, in, in this very abstract lesson of Moshe's being refused by the Almighty to enter for the good of the Jewish people, because that way the temple that he would have built, instead of um, protecting the Jewish people, would have been to their detriment, and thus his not going into the land facilitated a protection for the people of Israel. I'm looking at all of this and wondering what is really going on here. First of all, let's look at Moshe himself and put ourselves in his place and understand the frustration that these verses really represent. If ever there was a relationship in the Torah that we could describe as a love, if ever it could be said about Hashem and an individual that we see clearly the love. It's Moshe and his relationship with Hashem. We read in Parshat Chukat at the incident of Miriam's uh, quarantine and the Lashon Hara, the gossip that was spoken against Moshe, we read about uh, Hashem's I'm sorry, that was at the end of Parshat Bahalotcha. We read about Hashem's testimony to his relationship with Moshe. Now, now the man Moshe was exceedingly humble, more than any person on the face of the earth. And we read these verses. If there shall be prophets among you in a vision, shall I, Hashem, make myself known to him? In a dream shall I speak to him? Not so is my servant Moshe in my entire house. He is the trusted one. Mouth to mouth do I speak to him in a clear vision and not in riddles as at the image of Hashem does he gaze. Why did you not fear to speak against my servant Moshe? What an incredible testimony to the relationship, the confidence, the trust that Hashem had in Moshe. So that can't be in any way questioned, that level of, of love. And so, what happens when one of us feel that we have 
one thing that means so much to us that we're coming to Hashem with all our heart and begging Him from that place of mercy, that place of compassion, begging for this one thing, and it doesn't happen, and we don't get it. We don't get that request. We tend to feel Hashem doesn't love me. We tend to feel that Hashem is on the outs with me. We tend to feel that we're being denied. That we're getting a raw deal, essentially. And here, Moshe Rabbeinu, about whom the Torah gives unparalleled, unprecedented accolades that testify to the level of love that existed between him and the Almighty, Moshe Rabbeinu had one request that meant so much to him, and it was denied. Did he feel unloved? Did he feel that this was an indictment of his relationship with God? Or on the contrary, did he realize that this too was for the ultimate good, not only of the Jewish people, but somehow for himself? In other words, the level of understanding 